It is knife review time on the Apostle P channel, and tonight it's about a dragonfly. Not just any dragonfly, but the Spider Code Dragonfly 2 in H1. Hmm, the salt edition. We'll talk about a little voodoo steel tonight. Stay tuned, guys. Hi gang, Rob here. It's the evening of 12 December 2013. Tonight will be the first in a series of several guest blade reviews during the month of December, uh, courtesy of good friend of the Apostle P channel, Campfire Talk, one of my oldest and dearest YouTube buddies. And we've got a few knives in for sharpening, as you saw in yesterday's <clears throat> video. And a couple of them I'm not familiar with, so we're going to take a close look at them. The first one is this dragonfly. A knife that Campfire Talk has had in his rotation for, I think, about, oh, what, five or six months. Bought this knife just before he went on vacation this summer because he knew he was going to be in a saltwater environment for a week or so. And he wanted to use it as a companion when he goes running. I think because he sweats saltwater as well. And he wanted something corrosion, uh, corrosion resistant. And something that as he ran on his route, if he encountered a rabid dog or the like, he would be able to defend himself with. I have to laugh. The cutting edge on this bad boy is about 1.9 inches. Um, operates best in a forward grip. So <clears throat> from your index finger to your piercing point, a little less than two inches. Um, not sure this is the best defensive tool, but, you know, any excuse we knife guys can think of to justify a purchase, we will use. Uh, so that's that. Now, I do know, before I get into my impressions, uh, that Campfire Talk has been extremely pleased with this knife. In fact, it's been a little hard of him to let go of for a week or so. And I'll get some close-ups for you. You can see this knife has some use on it. Got some, oh, you know, some radial scratches on the blade tang from where it comes in and out of the frame. Got, uh, oh, I think there are a few up there on the main grind near the tip. Let's see on this side. Anyway, you know, this thing hasn't been a safe queen. It hasn't been babied. It's been a sort of semi-constant companion for Campfire Talk. And he loves it. He loves the weight. He loves the pocketability. He loves the utility, the cutting ability. Uh, I was talking to him on the phone today, or maybe yesterday, and just before he sent it up to me, he was using it to prune some crepe myrtle bushes of his, and it was performing well. And, you know, as he characterizes it, uh, and this knife ran with its factory edge until he sent it to me. So several months of fairly hard use. And he said it just felt like an aggressive cutter. Like if you got your finger close to it, it was going to jump out and cut you. Uh, this H1 steel, and we'll get into a little more about the H1 steel as we go along. But it has a pretty aggressive quality about its cutting edge. Uh, interesting. He loves it. Now let's get into the specifics of what it is. Obviously, this is a 
and Spyderco's family of lockbacks from Seki City. Uh, this is the second iteration of the Dragonfly in construction. I guess the third version if you take steel into account. But it is the Dragonfly 2. Um, and I think over the Dragonfly's evolution a couple things have happened. Um, it used to be a completely riveted knife uh, both in in the body construction as well as the pivot now it is a screw together construction knife uh, I believe the pocket clip screw and barrel hold the back of the knife together and then there is a another fastener which is the pivot for the lock bar and then the pivot for the blade itself I think you can totally disassemble this knife if I understand things correctly. I believe it also in its original form had the integral polymer pocket clip and now it has the reversible uh, wire clip. A lot of guys just really dig this clip. I never have been a super fan of it. Um, I, I deal with it, especially on a small knife like this. Uh, I anchor with the pocket clip as I'm opening the knife and this wire clip, although it is very sturdy and holds the knife well in pocket, I feel it move side to side as I'm opening the knife. And you can sort of see, although it's got a lot of tension this way, it's very easy to move sideways. And it just kind of is unsettling as you're opening the knife, but you get used to it. Um, I've had it on several of my spider codes and it doesn't bother me horribly, but I don't love it as much as some guys do. So anyway, we went from a riveted knife with an integral polymer pocket clip and no jimping in its original form to now where we have a knife that's able to be disassembled, which is kind of good in this saltwater specific model just to get any of that gritty rocky salt out of the knife if you need if it really gets embedded um, we've got a great removable and reversible pocket clip we have jimping in the choil area as well as on the thumb ramp and molded into the polymer handle <clears throat> which makes for an extremely secure grip in this little utility knife construction wise the handle is linerless as you can see Fiberglass reinforced nylon or Zytel, not super rigid. You can see it kind of compress. It's it is a bit flexible, but you know that the, the blade is only two and a quarter inches long. Um, not going to be under a lot of torsional stress, is it? This knife doesn't have to be super strong. Uh, the blade is a gorgeous little mini leaf shaped spider co profile with a decorative and weight reducing swedge at the spine comes to a very acute and very straight ahead point uh, which is pretty neat great little letter opener um, great for fine work you can come way forward on it and pinch grip it i mean it's just a super versatile little utility blade in all other versions except the salt the steel is going to be VG10, I believe. Um, I don't know this for sure, but it might have been offered in ZDP 189 at some point and maybe in a sprint run. I don't know why I seem to remember that, but I do. Uh, but generally, it's going to be black handle, VG10 blade. Uh, if it's the VG10 blade, it's going to be saber ground, which is like a, <clears throat> a mid breadth flat grind to the edge. In H1, as you can see, it is hollow ground which gives you a little leaner blade behind the cutting edge and it is necessary because of the steel we'll talk about that as we go on dimensionally as I said blade length two and one quarter inches handle length three and five sixteenths do the math that gives us an overall length of five and nine sixteenths total length weight of this knife an unbelievable 1.2 ounces. It weighs literally nothing. Okay, I'm going to do a little wipe down. Bear with me. Talk amongst yourselves. 
we want to wipe it down because we're going to talk about the steel. <clears throat> the steel is, as I said, H1, which is a completely stainless steel, meaning it will not stain. Unless, of course, you laser etch a logo into it and really burn up the structure, and then you're going to get a little bronzing like you see in the one of H1 after a week at the beach. Makes it actually look kind of cool. It's never really changed according to Campfire Talk. It bronzed itself just a little bit and stayed like that. <clears throat> um, okay, let's move along. How do we get a knife-grade steel, meaning hard enough and tough enough to be a knife, and be completely rust-free when it has in it, get ready for this, 0.15% carbon, almost nothing, and only 14 to 16% chromium. Huh. How, how does that work? We would think of that like a, as a, <clears throat> what, like a 404 stainless or something? I mean, how does this get hard? I mean, okay, 14 to 16% chromium I get with no carbon that's going to take the chromium and make carbides out of it, re reducing its ability to provide rust protection. How does it get hard? Well, the answer is that it makes, uh, it, it makes nitrides. Um, <laughs> it has a lot of nitrogen in it, uh, about 1%. And it also adds a little nickel, a lot of nickel, 6 to 8% of nickel. And it gets hard due to a process called precipitation hardening. Some call it age hardening. And then, for good measure, it is also susceptible to work hardening. So, what does age hardening mean? It means that metal is heated to a critical temperature somewhere in some kind of no man's land. It doesn't go into solution like you would with an austenitic steel up around, you know, 17 or 1800 degrees and then rapidly quenched. It gets held at some temperature somewhere in the middle and weird things happen to it. Interferences are created. Uh, strange structures appear and if you hold it there long enough they become stable and with the right voodoo chemistry that makes the steel hard. Um, that's about as good as I can explain that for you guys. Um, it's very odd stuff. And then top it off uh, by this little magical quality when you are grinding this steel, generating heat, not only does it like to move around a little bit, which necessitates the hollow grind, I believe they do this with two opposing wheels. Uh, so the knife is actually pinched between the two large radius hollow grinding wheels. <clears throat> And as that heat's being generated and that material is being removed, it gets even harder. There are, uh, there are reports in the knife world of serrated spider coes uh, in H1 steel that, due to the serration grinding, have cutting edges in the 65 to 68 Rockwell area. Um, I don't know that that's ever been tested, you know, whether uh, somebody has sectioned these. Um, these serrated blades and, and made uh, micro hardness tests and mounted samples. I don't know. Um, it's possible to do that, but I kind of tend to think that it is folklore more than it is fact. But we know it is a pre precipitation or age hardening steel that also is work hardenable. Um, now, w what do we know about that as far as how it works? Well, Again, just to give you Campfire Talk's perspective and his experience with the steel, um, it's five or six months old. It's seen a lot of use, you know, a lot of cardboard, a lot of little tree branches, a lot of, uh, a lot of letters opened. <clears throat> and he is sort of a, a religious stropper of his knives, but when they need to be sharpened, uh, he kind of likes to send them to me, which I appreciate. 
This knife went from factory edge <clears throat> with only strapping for five or six months before he, he really felt the need to send it to me. And guys, it was still sharp when I got it. It was a little a little irregular. Um, had some some spots that were duller and flatter than others, but it, it would still cut. Um, not a problem there. Uh, so it obviously holds an edge rather well. And does it take an edge, though? That's a good question, isn't it? Well, now, granted, we've got less than two inches of cutting edge here. But can you see how it responds to sharpening and polishing? I'd say pretty well, from appearance's sake anyway. And to my touch, you know, I, I do a polished edge, so it's not, not toothy right off the bat. But it's quite sharp quite sharp. Uh, we're not going to be applying much pressure doing that sort of Murray Carter thing. It'll dig right in. Uh, hang on a minute. I left my paper out of reach. Uh, Jeopardy music plays in the background while I walk around the table. Okay. Let's see if it'll cut. I'm <clears throat> I'm thinking it will, but I just got this off the sharpening bench a little while ago and haven't really done much with it since I strapped it. Um, how'd that sound? Pretty good? Not bad, huh? Wow, see that. Got a little too sharp with it there. Wow. That's a glider. <clears throat> okay, so it holds an edge, it takes an edge, and I gotta tell you, without much effort, <clears throat> uh, this factory grind, at least as, uh, <laughs> as I got it after months of use and stropping, it was a little inconsistent. As with a lot of these Seiki City knives, the grind was pretty jacked up down here at the base. It got real, real shallow, and there's a little recurve there. I, I really couldn't get out without putting a sharpening notch in, which I didn't want to do because the, uh, the cutting edge is so short anyway. <clears throat> and, you know, it was, it was sort of uh, real shallow, got a little steep, got a little shallow, got a little steep. It was... Kind of odd, but didn't take a lot of work. Le you know, less than an hour from uh, from 220 through the grits, through the tapes, and uh, even with a tiny little micro bevel and strop, I did it in less than an hour. Not a big, uh, not a big deal at all. And I had to remove a fair amount of material to get where you see now. <clears throat> and this is uh, the angle Spider Coast says they put on their knives. It's a 15 degree per side secondary bevel and in this case I did oh about an 18 and a half or 19 degree micro bevel and a and a real tiny one I, I wanted it to be a I wanted it to be a pretty vicious little thing when campfire talk gets it back and it is um, so uh, rust resistance aside but it's a great benefit and more than an added bonus it's the characteristic that overrides this blade steel <clears throat> but aside from that pretty good knife steel. Don't have anything real bad to say about it. I didn't see uh, any chipping, didn't see any rolling. I saw some flattening. Easy to bring back to scalpel sharp. Great stuff. Voodoo, but great stuff. Now how does this knife handle? Well, it's a tiny little package and for my hands, which are medium to large, I wear a large glove, which fits me a little not quite as tightly as I would like, but I'm, my hands are too big for medium gloves. So <clears throat> you can kind of see how I'm manipulating this and it's, it's not terribly unwieldy. You can, I can actually get in and flick it open with my thumb. Don't think I can do a middle finger flick on this thing. 
can't bend my finger back that far. I probably could if I practiced. But very easy to open just in the full range of motion. Move. You know, a lot of knives this small, it's kind of hard to even open them with a thumb hole. Like uh, the Kiwi, which isn't a lot smaller than this, <clears throat> got a much stronger back spring, but um, it's a fairly manipulable little knife. Um, interesting too, you're, I guess you could grip it back here, um, but it really begs your hand to be up in the forward choil, either with thumb on ramp or thumb coming forward uh, into this position. And I can really almost get a four finger grip. My pinky ends up being more of an anchor or a stop than anything else, but I got a lot of hand on this little knife and great control, great purchase. Uh, and is it comfortable? Uh, yeah, for a, a knife this small, it is. Uh, could you go reverse? Mm, no. <laughs> Don't know why you'd want to. I guess if you come up here with the pinky and the choil, you can, but. I don't know what you're going to do like that. <clears throat> How about uh, for a draw cut? Yeah, not, you know, like if you were going to cut some rope or uh, something that was easier to pull cut for more control, that's not a bad grip at all. I mean, really not, not a bad grip at all. And because of the way that you naturally grip this knife, you're not going to really ever hammer grip it. I don't think. Um, mostly you're going to be in the normal saber grip. <clears throat> so even with the lock back, you're really never going to accidentally uh, release that lock. I mean, really, you're, all the pressure on that knife is going to be in this pinch grip. So I guess overall, uh, for a knife of its size, the ergonomics are very, very good. Uh, yeah, there's not a lot to complain about with this little guy. Now, I will admit, though, you guys, this is probably not a knife I would buy for me. Um, generally, I just don't carry anything this small unless it's kind of a gents folder or a traditional knife. Um, you know, if I'm going to go real small, I'm probably going to go dressy or, you know, something that makes me feel a little good from a quality of materials standpoint or you know I'm feeling a little traditional or something like that I'm, I'm probably not ever going to be an EDC or of a dragonfly I did buy one for my son Connor for Christmas a couple years ago though he loves it it's just your black handle VG10 version but it is a dragonfly too so the same construction as this one so I guess if I were going to make a recommendation, first of all, I would probably ask you about your preferences. You know, if you like a modern sort of, uh, you know, tactically oriented small EDC knife, meaning one hand deployable, one hand releasable, modern materials, durable construction. Uh, something you don't have to worry about polishing brass or damaging wood handles. Something that you can really use for a little workhorse utility blade. And you want it to be an ounce. I would say go get a dragonfly. Absolutely. But just understand most of you who are into the bigger knives. This is a really, really small knife. Um, it behaves, I would say, smaller than a SOG Flash 1. Obviously, it behaves smaller than a Delica. Um, and, you know, for me, a Delica-sized knife is just about as small as I'm going to go in a modern knife like this. Um, but, again, let me just sort of speak for Campfire Talk. He loves this knife for certain applications. Day at the beach and swimming trunks, in and out of the ocean all day, running... Uh, things where, you know, maybe even uh, some hiking applications uh, where your folder needs to be an ounce. Um, the Dragonfly is a great choice. And we haven't really talked about this, but isn't it cool looking? I mean, look at that blade. It's like a, 
like a little Batman knife or something, isn't it? Especially if it were black. I'm not sure what that means if it's yellow. It does have that really cool bi-directional Spider Co. Volcano grip. I mean, you're not going to lose uh, lose the handle on this little guy. I can tell you that. How about uh, lock up and blade play? Well, uh, you know the drill, don't you? If you watch this channel much, not a lover am I of uh, Seiki City Spider Co. Lockbacks, with rare exception. Let's see how this one does. Let's look our up and down. Um, uh, extremely minuscule, if any, and side to side, zilch, and uh, a knife with no steel liners in it, and I don't believe washers either. I think you guys can maybe see in there better than I can because I got old eyes. But I don't think there's any. I haven't had it apart even after sharpening. Guess what I did? Uh, dish soap, a brush, and lots of hot water. Uh, knife needs really no lubrication. <clears throat> That's how free the blade is with zero side to side play. And I didn't really th think this knife wanted oil in it, um, given what you can do with it and where you might take it. It's probably better off without any oil. It's going to attract less debris and it really doesn't seem to need it. And the pivot seemed to be very resistant to any abrasive slurry. It doesn't feel like there's anything in there. I tried to be careful, but uh, it seems to run pretty clean. <laughs> I probably ought to quit playing with this, or I'm going to want to buy one for myself. As usual with the uh, those boys in Colorado, no matter where they have their knives put together, they come up with some pretty good ideas, don't they? Sometimes it takes me a while to get them, but uh, generally, if it says Spyderco on it, there's a, a thought process behind it that's not generally too bad. And the Dragonfly would definitely fall into that category for me. Great job, Spyderco. Okay, Campfire Talk, one down, three to go. Um, <laughs> we should have them back to you in plenty of time to open presents, my friend. That's all for tonight. Grace to you and peace, my friends, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, the word and Campfire Talks Dragonfly are sharp.